I'm Travis Bader, and you're listening to the Silver Core Podcast. In this, our very first episode, I'm sitting down with Nick Bolton and Paul Ballard, both retired police firearms instructors, where we talk about firearms training in Canada versus the United States, as well as becoming a firearms instructor, and how firearms training has changed over the years, and what's stayed the same. Travis Bader here from the Silver Core Studios, and I'm sitting down with Nick Bolton and Paul Ballard, and we're going to talk about firearms training in Canada and maybe a few other things as well. Nick, I've known you for a very long time. You've got 50 years of shooting experience, retired police training from 95 to 2013. You're an instructor at the Firearms Academy of Seattle for a number of years as well. I think for about the same span, 95 to 2013. That's correct. Welcome, Nick. Good to be here. The other person I have has got five years. He's been retired from a local police agency. Six years of his time on the force was as a full-time instructor for uh, firearms training. Got into training the Canadian Fire and Safety Course in around 1994, around the Fire and Safety Course inception, which led to civilian firearms training, shooting coaching, bear defense, and, and a number of other things. And that's Paul Ballard. Welcome, Paul. Well, thanks, Travis. It's a pleasure to be here on your, I guess, your maiden voyage in the podcast business. Here. Yes. Yeah. Be easy on me. It's very uh, number very first podcast that uh, we've put out. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're looking forward to it and hope many more. Many yes, more. indeed. Definitely. So, um, well, why don't we just get rolling here? Uh, Nick, you know, known you for a very long time. I, I'm thinking back, I think it was uh, 18 years old. I was hired by a local armored car company and I was at the Justice Institute range and who was my instructor out there, but uh, Nick Bolton. Why, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, what got you into the, uh, the realm of firearms training? What got me into it is basically just a deep interest in shooting and firearms and as your interest grows as your um, experience grows you always want to expand and it's the next step once you have been a shooter once you've reached a certain level to me the next step is then to start teaching and then Paul, now, are you, I even remember at that time hearing your name bantered about for years. People said, well, have you seen Paul shoot? You got to go see Paul shoot. Uh, I guess you had a couple of uh, tricks you'd do on the range that would quite impress everybody. Uh, it was a number of years before I actually got the opportunity to uh, to see you shoot. I know that... Uh, well, it's better to be a has-been than it ever was. So <laughs> I'm going to just wallow in has beenery. But, you know, it's interesting. I, I just got to play on something that Nick said there, and that is when you're involved in something and learning about it, truly the way to learn th something better uh, and, and and become more adept at it is to teach it. Because there's, uh, you know, when you are performing, and that's what teaching is all about, uh, your performance has to be pitch perfect. Certainly by the, the number of years I've been around this, this game and, and teaching it, I know it certainly has improved my skills. Why don't we just take a look about, uh, well, firearms training in Canada, uh, being a firearms instructor in Canada, that's, it's not really a popular activity. I wouldn't say there's a lot of firearms instructors, particularly in the civilian market. No, and that's true. And that, uh, kind of is where it evolved from, you know, you, we were both have a, a strong law enforcement background and in law enforcement, uh, at the times that Nick and I became involved in this, it was, uh, certainly a transitional time from a uh, working it off the corner of your desk fast and loose not a whole lot of course training standards established they were just doing it the way they'd always done it uh we really i guess got our chops in the law enforcement world uh developed what was a professional uh program and understanding the the need to be able to justify what you were teaching all of your course training had to have a, a standard behind it the individual on on how they would deliver it that was up to them, but as long as the standards were being met. Moving towards the civilian market, there was always people looking on the periphery. We were involved in, you know, numerous shooting competitions involving non-law enforcement shooting enthusiasts who always wanted coaching, instruction, and, and through the, I guess it was the, oh, I guess, what was the name of it? <laughs> it, it I forgot now that we used to shoot PPC. Uh, we would run classes and instructional classes for the those that, was had that Lisa law enforcement shooting association. And we started to formalize classes and put those on in addition to the monthly matches that we were running. Uh, Lisa still going strong at Burke mountain club. 
Oh, correct. Yeah, and it's yeah. still around. And and in those days, uh, Lisa was you know fifteen to eighteen people showing up for a monthly match. And by the time three or four years had progressed, uh, we were showing regularly seventy five people at a monthly match. Wow! And uh, when we hosted the nationals, uh, the Canadian Police Combat Association nationals, we had one of the biggest turnouts uh, historically for years. Then also gave away a lot of guns in those yes, days indeed. too. Yeah. What I would say, add to that is there has always been an informal group of trainers in the civilian area. People who specialize in a particular sport, uh, for example, the Ipswich Black Badge trainers. Um, most clubs have a guy who is competent and will and can train. Um, you've got to get your start somewhere. When I started, which is a long time ago, it was usually your parent. Right. And the first person to take me to a shooting club was my dad. And he showed me the basics. And, of course, other members of the club, the Risley Rifle Club, um, helped out, um, kept you on the straight and narrow. I was only, what, probably 14 at the time. But now an awful lot of people are coming into shooting with no introduction That's from true, a parent. Yeah. And this is where a civilian instructor or a group of civilian instructors is going to become extremely important. Yeah, that's true. You know, when I think back, what was the first formal firearms instruction I had besides my dad saying, be careful, don't point at anything. Right. Uh, but I went to uh, summer camp, Timberline Ranch out in Maple Ridge. And at Timberline Ranch, they had a 22 program, eight years old, uh, shooting at cans, hanging from strings. And at the end of the uh, the two-week camp, they gave out marksmanship badges. And I was kind of hooked at that point. I spent, you know, informal time with my cousins back in Manitoba. You know, every day spent with a 22 rifle single shot uh, cooey in my hand. Good fun. Uh, my cousin down in California, bless him, he uh, he was much older than I was, but he was uh, in the uh, ROTC at the time. He was very helpful in, in giving, you know, instruction on how to shoot better. And then once I got into the Army cadets, that was probably the first formalized training that I had and first formalized competition through uh, the BCRA and the DCRA, small right. board. And what age was that? Uh, I started with the cadets when I was 13. Okay. And I shot uh, all the way through that till I was 17 with BCRA, DCRA. And then later I, I rejoined the the BCRA and DCRA, which was the best fifteen dollars you could spend every year, no kidding. you'd show up. All the ammunition was provided. I guess it was the closest thing would be the the civilian marksmanship program in the mm. United States to that, right? And I think we got something in uh, Canada actually. What? Did... Oh, the yeah, the BCRA, uh, which is sort of the provincial offshoot of the Dominion of Canada Rifle Association, still exists. Right? Uh, they sponsor the sniper shoots and a lot of the service conditions matches, and it's it's evolved a lot. I mean, in I would say devolved because you're not getting the free ammunition or the included ammunition. Um, I remember civilians who were members would show up. They would be provided with the English high powers to shoot the service conditions match, pistol match with. I yeah. love it. it was Lots good. of fun. Those cadet groups, those youth groups did and do a very valuable service because there's nothing better than teaching people safety when they're young, teaching them competency when they're young. I don't know if the scouts still have a shooting program. They used to, but well, certainly the cadet groups do. And, for example, Chilliwack Fish and Game runs a camp for the youth, uh, what is it, 12 to 14, which is young. But they're taught firearm safety as part of the days they spend at that camp. These are things that we've we got to keep going. That's true. And, uh, I mean... The Army cadets, when I started with them, we were firing SMGs, and uh, there was initially the Lee Enfield rifle, 303, yes. God bless but it. eventually, <laughs> um, in our cadet corps, we I think we had 35 FN C1A1 7.62 rifles, and that would, uh, there used to be a, a range uh, by the uh, Eagle Ridge Hospital, where, right. it, where it is now, at the top of Noons Creek Road, the Port Moody uh, fishing game club and that's where we used to go and shoot these fn rifles and that was you know the really the start for me uh today i don't think the cadets are allowed to shoot anything other than air rifles i'm i'm and any any stuff that's done you know outside of that is is probably done with a local gun club as opposed to a sanction of the 
of the Royal Canadian Army Cadets or Air Cadets or Sea Cadets. But. I think they're still doing a little bit of 22. Uh, they yeah. got some Anschutes. I think they got some uh, full yeah. bore competitions because they do send them over to Bisley still. Yeah, okay. Um, and there is a big biathlon, I think it is, program here in BC. Um, a number of the cadet forces have done some training at our club um, in the past, and it's quite a big competition. But but I think we're right here is in the past, and we're talking 45 years or so ago, it was easy for a kid in particular to get involved in something where they would get some form of safe, competent instruction in the use of firearms. Mm. Again, we look, all of us had fathers that uh, had firearms that, that got us into shooting. Um, but today we see more and more people coming, particularly in the Canadian Firearm Safety Course. Uh, people just say, hey, I always was interested in this. I'm showing up, but I don't know where I'm going to go because no one in my family, uh, maybe some of my friends who have already taken the safety training and have bought a firearm, you know, we're going to go out and try shooting. But where do you actually go? Where do you go to get competent uh safe training and and that's what we really need to move ahead there's a lot of charlatans that are out there you know sure pe people that are doing it not necessarily so much for the love of the sport or of the enjoyment of teaching people but more for the the money is the motivator we've seen that yes and, and i think you know you've said it many times give a quality product the money will follow you got yeah. it you know it, it is a way to pay for your i call it my habit my addiction um i Whiskey? you know the, <laughs> that too. no 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 it's uh i'm using it to pay for my my hunting addiction my firearms addiction you know it's it's extra money it's additional money that i make but uh, i certainly don't do it just for that when you started talking there about father's teaching and things like that and it's brought to mind a kind of a strange thing that travis mentioned right at the beginning how i was one of the instructors his armored car course well, Travis's dad taught me at the BC Police Academy. So what comes around seems to go around. It yeah. does, no, there's yes. always, it yeah, does. there's it, what they, that, you know, so many degrees of separation on everything, you know, it just keeps coming back. So Yeah, small world. So Nick, you've done a fair bit of teaching in the States. Yes. Um, what are your observations being an instructor in the States versus being an instructor in Canada? I think the biggest difference I have seen is when you teach in the States, nearly all your teaching revolves around self-defense. Um, concealed weapons courses, carrying a concealed weapon, um, being able to use a handgun or a rifle or a shotgun to protect yourself. And when you teach up here, that is not the case. With the exception of, of course, the uh, law enforcement right. and similar armed professionals, um, what you're teaching up here is firearm safety, of course, but also competition shooting, how to shoot a gun accurately, how to shoot a gun accurately and quickly, this type of thing. You're not dealing with the complexities of um, self-defense. Now, I know at Silver Corps, we've always been very careful about what we teach and how we market what we teach. And we want to ensure that everything that we provide is applicable. It's going to bring value to the client. And it's going to be something that can be used in a sporting situation. But we also do training for um, people who will be using the firearm for defense of their life. What are your thoughts on that sort of training in Canada to the civilian market? Because I know there's, there's definitely an appetite for the U.S. style training in Canada. I think there's a certain um, excitement level in people's minds when they start to talk about um, self-defense, what they don't realize is the terrible responsibilities that go along with it. And ask any policeman who shot anybody what he went through. And right. I would say at least 99.5% of police shootings are justifiable and valid. Yet they still go through this thing. People who want to carry a gun for self-defense. Never think on that side of it the other thing that and this is not my thought but it's something once somebody once said to me is all these people want to carry a gun to protect themselves how many of them own a fire extinguisher in the home yeah good how point. many carry a first aid kit in the car um but let's take that out of it 
there could come a time when you do have to defend yourself and it's valid to learn to you do it legally to do it within the bounds of public perception that the public sees it as being the correct thing to do that's a you know i think it's a big thing that you're touching on there and of course the whole thing that goes around it the legality right now that all goes way beyond standing on the range and pressing the trigger I don't know if I can chime in. I mean, one of the things that, you know, you continually get asked about this stuff, you know, or the, the suggestions that are made, just the mere presence of a, of a firearm is going to change how people are going to behave around you and everything else. And, and I don't think enough thought or depth of thought is actually given to, to what's at hand. I mean, if you want to carry a gun, the first thing you have to learn how to do is how to keep that gun in your possession. Right. People, are you are you willing to, to spend the time on, on the gym mats to learn how to, you know, defend yourself physically before you would ever have to defend yourself uh, with lethal force? You know, you have to be able to use hands-on techniques to keep that gun in your possession. And, I, and again, you know, we don't have anything in place in, in our country that allows, you know, to, uh, to present a firearm to prevent somebody from coming in to take your property away, you know, that, you know, depending on the state that you go in, the, you know, the castle doctrines that exist, sure. uh, we, we, we see a lot of people think, oh, that's a good idea, but it's not really a good idea. You know, when your house catches on fire, going back to Nick's fire extinguisher analogy there, do you fight the fire yourself or do you call 911 and, and ask the professionals to come put that fire out? Do you have a plan in place to get your family out safely and move on from there? So... And that seems to be a, a bigger a bigger conversation, definitely, that uh, people seem to get jazzed about the concept. They right. watch TV, they say, this is what I'd like to be like, this is what, without actually putting in the uh, the necessary effort. There's, there's so much surrounding that decision that isn't firearms related. Yeah, and so what we're doing here in Canada, I think, is the right thing. We offer the ability to improve their skills with that firearm. It's like going to a golf pro. You know, would you go and buy a set of golf clubs and just head out to the links and, you know, whack the ball around and and go, man, this is not going so well for me? Or would you rather take the time to get with a a competent professional that has instructional skills and can sharpen your game? So it's not a waste of money. And I and I find that is where we need to sell people more in Canada. That's that's the difference here. You know, you're you're not learning this as a a part of your Second Amendment rights, you know, to 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 keep or, or bear arms. You're doing this because it's a sport. Right. You know, and and that's what we're we're leaning towards is firearms instruction in Canada. If we go back a little bit, I'm sure there's been a lot of things we've all learned over the years doing this, but if you were to give a piece of advice to anybody aspiring to be a firearms instructor, what advice would you give them? You got to like people first. That's the big thing. And and one of the things, you know, in law enforcement, if you want to become a firearms instructor, then it it's one thing, develop competency, uh, meet the standards required by the agency, move forward from that. If you want to get into the civilian world, you need to learn people. And, and, and people that are, are not taking your training because they're being compelled to, like they would be in the military or in, in law enforcement, it's a different thing. You have to offer them a product, um, and, I, and I say product, that, that they feel they're getting value for. You have to cater to the individual's needs. Uh, you have to be prepared to understand that. You have to be extremely perceptive to be in this. When you look at a group of six or seven people in a group of shooters and you realize that one's got huge hands, one's got small hands, something as simple as that, and you have to have a lot of arrows in your quiver to pull out those different arrows to address the different requirements that those people have. And that, that really measures you. Um, mentorship with another instructor big, big, big difference in, in how you will evolve as an instructor in your own right. And not just one. Uh, you see a lot of people that will take you know, the opportunity to mentor and they want to become that, that mentor. And I say, no, never. Become your own person. Take something that that one person has to offer. Find another mentor. Take some of their best stuff. And then become your own instructor from it. And, and that's an approach that I've tried to do you know, through my career as an instructor. I take a little bit of everybody's stuff. Make it my own. I agree with that. How about about you, Nick? Well, to some degree, I would echo what Paul's saying, that too often people will, they become one-trick ponies. 
They learn one way of doing things. They do quite well at it, maybe even extremely well at it. And they never expand beyond that. And if you're teaching, particularly when you're teaching civilians, then there's a whole wealth of information that is different that you've got to look at. Um, each one will come with a different gun. Whereas if right. you're on a police range, everybody has the same gun. So you got to know how the different ones operate. Vast differences in ages, sizes, and physical condition. Very important because just because you can do it doesn't mean they can. And well, just because they can't do it doesn't mean you've got to give up. Right. You're, you're being paid. You've got to get there and you've got to find something that works for them. Jim Cirillo, an old friend of mine, that was one of his big things. And he taught everything from a guy with one leg to a, how old was she? She was about an 82 year old lady that needed a pistol. And you've got to search out what pistol should she have? How the hell is she going to carry it? How is she going to use it? She's 82 years old, for goodness sake. Right. And, and that is, you know, you really bring up an important point. Like, um, typically, uh, instructors in Canada do come from law enforcement. It, it's 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 a fact. And uh, so there you are when you're teaching to, a, you know, people that are, are in uniform. They're typically all of a, of a same physical condition. They're able to take a day and, and do it all. But I find with these civilian classes, you start looking at them and they don't have the wherewithal to be around the report, the recoil, you know, the, the continual covering of their ears. I mean, even wearing ear protection all day long, which I just completely take for granted, can no longer be taken for granted. You have to watch the people that you're training. They're in a completely unfamiliar environment, particularly the ones that are starting out. A lot of hand-holding. A lot of hand-holding. A lot of, you know, and you have to be prepared. You well, and egos, a lot of placating the egos. And of course, course. <laughs> you have to feed your own ego, most importantly, right? <laughs> if you're not egotistical, you can't be a, you know, much of an instructor, I don't think. But you have to know, you know, what's the right amount of your ego to give off. But really, um, hand holding without making it look like hand holding. Right. Um, you don't want to be condescending in any way. Uh, because, you know, people are not paying you uh, to be Don Rickles, right? You don't need to insult them or hurt their feelings or anything else. You've we got... saved that for law enforcement. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You get that out of you. And then, and then, of course, that's where sometimes law enforcement or the military carries that over. Right. I don't care what people say to me anymore, but uh, I'm not uh, going to do that to a paying customer. No, or you're not going to have too many more paying customers no. if you do that. And let's forget paying for the moment. The guy at the range who is competent, who is looking at your um, new members and teaching, he's probably not getting paid. So my goodness, he's got to have a love, both the teaching and the sport. Mm -hmm. He's, um, he's the guy to go to in, in many respects to get your first lessons. Yes, and, a point. and that's true. I mean, many many clubs that are out there are offering new members courses of some form, many of the different shooting disciplines, and that will be, you know, someone that may not necessarily have the formal training, but they like people. They're competent, you know, in, the, in their skill set for whatever discipline that they're doing. The generalities of it, though, or the, well, let's, you know, let's not say generalities, the the vast experience that some people have really makes them a cut above as far as the instructional word go world goes. It was funny when you were talking about earlier and you were saying one trick ponies and, and that is sort of the dogma. I hate things having to be dogmatic. You know, if you say this is the only way you can do it, the only way, oh, there's I a agree. couple of things that, but by far and away, you have to be adaptable. Oh, you know, when that person does come in and they've only got three fingers on one hand, how, how are you going to tell them this is the only way you can do it? Well, they right. can't physically do that. And you get to say, well, because you showed up with three fingers, we're not going to let you do it. And you can't do that. And that's a common thing I've seen in uh, new instructors. They'll find something, it works really well for them, or they've been told by somebody else, this is the way to do it. And then they will espouse that as gospel. This is, this is the only way to do it. We actually that's the bad side of ego. They must be best. They must stand out in front of the crowd and appear to be gods that walk upon the earth. Yeah. And if you change the scenario slightly, they aren't. Therefore, they won't change that scenario. Right. And, and, and as an instructor, I've watched so many instructors 
that tell everybody what to do, but never do it themselves. And, you know, a, a good friend of ours, an old timer, who always said, well, you're not going to demonstrate in front of everybody. And I said, of course I am. Oh, definitely. You know, they have to be able to model, you know, uh, you can't use solely words and pictures and, you know, and, and dry fire to try and communicate what you want somebody to do. They need to see you do that. Now, do you have to be, you know, uh, 110% in the skill level? No, but you certainly need to do it competently. And as an instructor, the trick is always do it a little slower, a little slower. It's not a competition and you need to do it slow enough so that they can see all the nuances of what you've just demonstrated. Very it, important. It is. And going back to the self-defense world, there's one of the instructors that um, I spent a lot of time with, and he talks about modeling all the time. And one of his things is he does a lot of interviewing of people who have survived gunfights. Probably because you can't interview those that don't. Yeah. But um, Oh, I shouldn't laugh when you're <laughs> saying that. But yeah, that's true. He's, he says that the number of people he has spoken to who everything was going wrong for them and then they got this mental picture of an instructor or the instructor or and they see and it just comes to them they go ahead and they're there to be interviewed yeah. and that that's something that uh, i know paul you've mentored me nick you've mentored me nick you would drill that in right from the beginning you'd say you have to be able to demonstrate you have to show them and whether you're on your 100 percent a game or maybe you pull a shot. That's important for the student to see that uh, we're all human and what they can aspire to. But I, I guess there's another side of that coin. There's uh, another fellow, really nice uh, fellow. He was a uh, instructor with GV Taps. I don't, I'm not sure if they're still actually called GV Taps. No, they're not, but never mind. For we sure. all know what you mean. Sure. Transit Authority. Transit Authority, the transit police. And uh, he was quite a uh, proficient competitive shooter. And uh, he explained to me, he says, you know what I do? I get all the uh, the officers come in, and it didn't help that the officers were a fair bit older than he was. Um, and I'll show them at how well I can shoot a course of fire. They can all stand there, and they watch me shoot 100% course of fire, and they can see how easy this is. I, I think that's the other extreme of demoing. And uh, yeah. At the time, I don't think he quite saw what that was creating for the course or from the student's perception. A, a certain level of demoing so that the uh, student knows that you're proficient. Yeah, it's balance, right? Right. Yeah, I, I agree. And, uh, you know, there could be nothing worse than watching somebody go through a 50-round course of fire by himself in front of the group. It's, it's taking everything in those, as we know, from any kind of instruction, small chunks. Feed them a small chunk, but you demonstrate that small chunk. Eat up. Yeah. Explain, demonstrate, imitate, practice. Correct. And then just keep moving yeah. along from that. It was interesting, just and because it's now sticking in my head, <laughs> uh, when people come forward and they say, well, this is the only way to do things. You got to do it this way. I always said in and around this, you know, defensive pistol craft, and I always like to call it defensive pistol craft. Can you do it in the dark? Can you do it in the run? Can you do it with both hands? Can you do it, you know? under extreme stress. And every time somebody shows me something, I always apply that. I says, do it with one hand. Sure. You know, do it with your other hand. Do it with your non-dominant hand. You know, and and that's really a, a good test of validity for, for a lot of that, you know, high speed, low drag stuff that you see, you know, is the the fundamental or the foundation of this guy's technique. You know, come and see the, the John Adams method. You know, we're going to learn the John Adams method. And you go, hmm. Well, he's got a couple of good points here, but if I do everything the way he does, it's not going to work for me. Well, that whole one-way doctrine just mm -hmm. does not speak to my sensibilities. No, no, I agree. The doctrine, the technique, is your starting point. So if, for example, there's a, a technique, the Ayub technique of shooting with a, hand, uh, with a flashlight. Right. And that is your starting point. You may have to modify it. You may have to change it radically for a shooter that is different right and you cannot just stick with that, that one technique that one rigid doctrine now the other thing of course that happens is somebody goes to a course and sees a doctrine and he comes back to teach it <laughs> and he's got no friggin idea how it was done and if you compare the two there is no comparison oh, right right yeah. so he's teaching entirely the wrong thing and then my favorite is you get the doctrine of recency the last course Doctrine you went on, recency, yeah. that guy is a god. We are all going to change. Well, 
Maybe not. You've got to, you know, it was great. You had a great course. He was very personable. It doesn't mean it's the best. It doesn't mean everything has to change now because you've seen him. That's it. The doctrine of recency. That's so true. Um, What I have found is everything, you know, comes around. All of a sudden you listen to somebody and they're saying, oh, yeah, we're doing it this way. And you go, well, hello, that's been around for an awful long time. And you look at the, even some of the old established, like I'm talking true gunfighters, not the, you know, but the, the, the Wyatt Earps of the world and Wyatt Earp, you know, said a lot of things. It made a lot of sense. I watch all this talk about being how fast, uh, you can possibly be, but the bottom line is as soon as you start ignoring your sights, you don't make hits. And what was Wyatt Earp's famous yeah. quote there? Take your time quickly. Speed is... Speed's fine, accuracy's final. Speed is fine, accuracy's final. Take your time quickly. That was my other one, but... There was a famous FBI gunfighter, Jelly Bryce, who the stuff he did was magnificent and was witnessed. Yeah. And it was great, but he couldn't teach anybody to do it. He could just do it. He could do it because he had certain physical attributes, and he was marvelous. But if he took you and me, we probably could not do it. Jeff Cooper was a fantastic fantastic person for looking at others doing something identifying breaking down what he saw that person doing and then writing it down or Mm -hmm. encouraging others to teach now his you know his his persona was almost too much for most people to learn from him directly but his writing and the way he could mentor other people who were quality instructors and again all back to what jeff cooper could watch somebody do the old Mozambique, you know, those, right. those things, you know, the El Presidente. El Presidente, that was Jeff Cooper. And when you say everything's new, this is stuff from the early sixties, right? The, you know, the, the Southwest Pistol League and, and what they were doing, that was the true inception of modern pistol craft that went on there. And those, and, and so much to do with Cooper's ability to articulate what was going on based on the skill sets of those people he surrounded them himself with. And you know, that, that whole circular, what's old is new again. I've seen that a lot reading the old books and just see the period of time that I've been involved in this in. Um, I can I can edit the gaps out. That's I almost thing. broke your headset. <laughs> I All I was thinking was the camera. <laughs> oh, not the camera again. Um, so you know what? That, why don't you tell them what happened to the camera? No, I'm not going to tell you what. I, I have nightmares about that. I have stress dreams. I'm not afraid of anything except you. So we'll, we'll talk about that camera on another but podcast. But that's a very good point. When you bring up stress dreams, stress. People who can shoot and who have reached a level of competency do not understand the level of stress that a new shooter goes through. Uh, Marty Hayes, who oh, I considered one of the, the best, best instructors in mm-hmm. Firearms Academy of Seattle. Uh, I learned so much from that guy. He had all sorts of little techniques that he passed on to me for reducing stress. If you looked at the um, a standard police line, you'd have some poor sap who was having problems with an instructor hovering an inch from their ear, helping them. I don't think you do because you've taken something that that person finds stressful and you've just doubled, tripled, quadrupled the stress level by standing right there. The instructor's there, the person who can make him fail. And you've got to remove that stress. If you can remove the stress that you bring to the range, you've gone a long way to helping that student achieve a level of competency. Mm -hmm. That's right. And and you are, as an instructor, the biggest stressor that somebody has. Especially if their job's riding on this, if there's a qualification at the end that they're... uh, Never mind looking like a total prat in front of all your mates. Right, Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it, it, you know, it, we keep going back to the law enforcement thing. I mean, we were talking about instruction in Canada and and you know how it approaches the civilian, but it the lessons I learned from watching law enforcement instructors and how they could alienate people mm-hmm. gave me a, a lot lot to work with and really helped me with, you know, helping other people. Really, I just thought, "Oh man, if somebody was treat me like that, I uh you know, that's no help. That's that's nothing there. And then one of the first things I notice when I take training and you 
very important. If you're going to be a trainer, you better be a good student. So that Absolutely. every opportunity to, for you to have to, to take somebody else's course, you need to do it. And even if you go in and you go, man, I knew everything that was on there, that's not true because there's going to be something you're going to learn. But when I go to take training from somebody and all I hear is rules, 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 and that you must stand here, you must do this, must do that. And that is one of the surefire um, tests that the person who's going to teach me doesn't know anything, Mm -hmm. you know, because they're going to stick with, you know, this dogma. We have to do it this way. You know, they, they, they don't have that, I don't know, depth and breadth to get out there. We saw that a lot in law enforcement. You did. Uh, I used to say law enforcement training was very incestuous Mm -hmm. because A teaches B who teaches C who teaches D. Nobody, there's no... And D never went back to see what was going on 10 years before A. No. Mm -hmm. Right? Or even if A knew what the hell he was talking about. Right, yeah, yeah. just because A was in that appointed position. And going back to what we kind of opened with here was to formalize the firearms training and make sure that the people that were coming in there were qualified to do it. Mm-hmm. And and one of the things, you know, that we really tried to do in the 90s there, once uh, I was with the police academy and, and kind of my own entity, was to start bringing in uh, instructors to give us different ways of doing it. Now, of course... The doctrine of recency is also equal to the doctor doctrine of distance. The further somebody comes from, the more they must know. <laughs> and and we have suffered a lot here with people saying, "Oh, we got to bring in you know this guy is coming in from Knoxville, Tennessee, and he's going to teach us this." Well, why does he have to come from Knoxville? You you've got a host of individuals here that you don't have to pay travel expenses to. You just got to pay them their rate, and they'll come teach you the same thing. Mm-hmm. Oh no. Didn't come from Knoxville. Didn't have a clipboard. Didn't travel more than 300 miles. Definition of an expert. An asshole from out of town with a briefcase. I think you said asshole. (laughs) I I think that's okay. I think we can keep that in. How about, you you guys know have probably heard this one before because I've heard it. Those who can do, those who can't teach. There's some truth to that. Um, If you take it in its widest possible context. But we're not talking or at least Paul and I aren't, are here about people who teach. We're talking about people who are competent instructors, Mm -hmm. and there's a difference. Mm -hmm. All you've got to do to be able to teach is be appointed by somebody important, particularly in the law enforcement world, Um, or the club president if you're um, in the civilian world. (laughs) Sure. Yeah, Um, but that's true, Nick. Like, in law enforcement, lots of people were teaching only because... Yeah, now I won't have to work night shift anymore, and there's a good job, and straight days, and I get car allowance, and I get uh, you know the other perks yes. that go along with it. I get yes. some overtime, and and that are, those are the ones that you know can't do teach. I got to be honest with you. I think there's a, a degree of you're maybe not as good as you once were that that uh, mm-hmm. you know has been better than it ever was. Um, you may not be the best, but you're the, you're better at conveying to somebody how to do the the technique. Sure. And I still find that uh, it doesn't matter uh, what goes on. I can always go to somebody else to watch what I'm doing to make me better at it. Mm-hmm. You know, that's always important. But there's certain people that are teaching that have no ability to to make you better at what you're doing. It's teach in being a good, competent instructor involves more than just guns. You've got to be able to communicate as right. well. That's huge. That's but the biggest piece. If you can't shoot, but that's what we're talking about here, mm-hmm. then how the hell can you teach somebody when you couldn't even teach yourself? Right. Now, as Paul said, you don't have to be the best, but you've got to be above competent. Mm-hmm. I always say 90%. On your absolute, now, Paul was the best, but <laughs> taking that up, sorry. <laughs> absolutely, your worst day, you have to be able to shoot ninety percent. That's the way I look at it. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're telling somebody they got to do this, you know, uh, not a hundred percent. I've watched lots of instructors say, "Well, you know, in order to become an instructor in my program, you must shoot a hundred percent. You must." No, you can't because you might have a, you know, a headache. You might be distracted. You know, anybody can miss once. Yeah, anybody sure. can miss once. That's sure. right. And this hundred percent stuff. Doesn't exist. Great. In a, the field of competitive endeavor, yes, 100% is what you want to always strive for. But a regular, consistent 90%. I remember um, at the police academy, you know, 
having the provincial responsibility. And they were saying, okay, there was 240 odd certified firearms instructors out there in the province of BC and everything from the conservation officers service to the sheriffs, to law enforcement, to armored car, you name it, all the, you know, the uniform people that were out there. And uh, so all these people based on an open ended uh, certificate that they had could continue to teach firearms to whatever agency, you know, firearms training to whatever agency they were associated with. And I said, this is not right. We need to, you know, you, you have to set sort of an, an end date on any certification. Sure. So that there is recertification to come in. So when it was announced that these people had to come in and start getting recertified, all of a sudden the numbers dropped down to less than a hundred. Right. And then once the recertification was established at 90% of whatever their provincial agency standard was and that they could practice and they had to pass a test and everything to come in, the numbers dropped even more and more and more. And it was surprising the number of these instructors that couldn't shoot. We're not talking 90%, but the 75% pass that mm-hmm. the students had, to, they couldn't, couldn't do that. So again, that was a real classic example. But yeah, yeah. we tightened things up by doing that. And that's the thing that's missing in the civilian market. Nobody has to show they can teach. Nobody has to show anybody right. that they can shoot. Yeah, you just All hang a shingle up. All they've got to do up. is show up. That's right. Hang a shingle up. Hey, I'm an instructor. Yeah. What qualifications yeah. do you have? Yeah. There should be something in I my mean, mind. you know, you can see like uh, the uh, IPSC, uh, IPSC with their, you know, black their black badge, badge yeah. training and you have to get... To, you have to become certified to become a black badge instructor. It's you know it's there. There's all kinds of workshops and 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 other opportunities to train and make yourself better. And and I would say to anybody, if you're going to go, you, you want to see that guy's you know see his resume, see where he's mm-hmm. been, what has he done, or she's been. Sorry, I, I shouldn't say he. Um, they where where have they been? What have they done? Well, traditionally, firearms have been a, a male dominated sport. <sighs> True, and we need That's to, changing, and we though. and we need to recognize that and and. <sighs> You know what? Maybe it shouldn't be. Because I tell you, if I've got a choice between teaching a bunch of guys and a bunch of women, the women are always the easier, the more receptive. Yeah. Guys got a penis to think they can shoot. I mm-hmm. mean, it's as simple well, as that. I mean, mm-hmm. God bless Vicky Farnham and, and Gila May Hayes. Both of them, and we've trained with them, have have kind of defined what it takes to train women and women are much more contextual in in the way they take training uh, from an instructor. So often you find particularly in, you know, firearms training or whatever, a man thinks, you know, back from the time we crawled out of the primordial ooze and got opposing thumb and fingers, Mm -hmm. we're naturally adept at, at utilizing weapons, right? Firearms. Whereas a woman doesn't want to necessarily know how to use it. They want to know why we're using it as well. Mm. So if you can incorporate the how with the end result, um, they're much more receptive to the instruction. And on top of that, when you finish with a a group of firearm safety course candidates, Canadian firearm safety course, people have, you know, basically no background in it other than you're teaching them the, the basics. You say, hey, you want to get into this stuff? Here's an opportunity to train with this individual. This, It's the women that are much more likely to go and do it. Very true. Yeah, I've noticed that. The other thing I've noticed, uh, if you take a brand new shooter, male, brand new shooter, female, by and large, from a strictly accuracy point of view, women will outshoot the guys. And I think that might have something to do with the fine motor muscle skills that are developed at much an earlier age. Uh, Like I look at uh, like my children, for example, and their classmates, uh, when the girls start drawing, they got the nice... uh, curse of writing loopy letters and the guys it looks like they stuck a crayon in their mouth and uh, wrote their name out um those fine fine motor muscle skills from uh holding the firearm trigger press lining up the sights and and if you explain to them why you need to do that why you need to you know achieve a compressed surprise break on the trigger if you explain that if you just don't say you know do it if you say why they understand and they will and they will work towards achieving that let's talk about on the range over the last number of years that you guys have been teaching and it doesn't necessarily have to be your scenario if you want to uh remember somebody else's scenario when maybe something very funny or a good learning experience let's say i never forget the 
you know, again, back to law enforcement, because that was where you really saw some some doozers. And this individual from a, a, an island department was uh, basically in the last throes of a police career, and they still hadn't even finished the basic training. All aspects, didn't matter, driving, legal, firearms in particular. So um, the insistence instructor was watching the rest of the line. I was standing behind this individual, and it was the close quarter, one-handed technique out of the holster, rock back, fire at the target. The individual clears the holster about, oh, a good second or two behind the rest of the group, fires the shot, which hits the steel pipe that holds the target frame up, only about a foot off the ground. And as you hear the clang of the bullet hitting the steel pipe, in my peripheral vision, about eight people down the line, I see one of the students go down. I just shot. told this story the other day. Oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> She shot. I realize. I grab this one, clear her pistol. Uh, she puts the gun away. I go down to the other one, and sure enough, that round came right off of that steel target, and and hit the other one in the abdomen. Took the took them off their feet. So. Abdomen. Abdomen. Yeah. <laughs> So what was the learning? What, what would you do differently? What would I have done differently? Um, actually, you know, a big part of what we do now is we don't use those kind of targets that close. Mm-hmm. We should never be shooting at steel that close. That uh, I use another pe- person's example. I mean, in the civilian steel target world, we know we have a an absolute, you talk about doctrine, no closer than 10 meters when you're shooting at steel targets. Um, I think on a... Seven in the States or something. Yeah, seven in the States. Hmm. Yeah. But, uh, you know, with the the risk of, of ricochet, and you remember the uh, Vancouver police was using steel knockdown targets, eh, pepper poppers. Right. And they were shooting uh, at pepper poppers that were overused. They were curved. And in... Uh, yeah, I think I have a couple upstairs, actually. Yeah, but what we do is, you know, we know from competitive shooting, you shoot it so many times one side, pull the pin out, turn it around, and that continual peening of the bullets against the, the target will, will change its shape back, and it'll stay flat. Uh, they were firing at curved targets, firing too close, and it ended up with one of the individuals getting, you know, a ricochet, mm-hmm. and, and it penetrated their neck. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's those kind of things where... Um, what could possibly go wrong? Well, and there's lots of other... broaden your damn experience. If they'd been in, involved in other things, that would not have happened. They would have recognized the danger. But they didn't because mm-hmm. incestuous training. Right. And let's go back to that one other thing too. Competitive shooting. I wouldn't go to an instructor that wasn't competitive. Mm-hmm. That is actually, let me, you know what? I didn't make this point earlier, which kind of went into my brain, swirled around and got out again. But if that person isn't prepared to compete against others, because that is the best artificial stressor that you can bring on, you know, to, to get into the field of competition, you know, would you go to a dojo to learn, you know, some kind of martial art from somebody that wasn't wearing a black belt? Probably not. Or, or or at least, you know. There's somebody who's got some competency right. so and they can if, show if you, that they can That's right. Perform. So now they may be as competent as all get out, but they cannot earn those belts unless they compete. Hmm. They must actually demonstrate what they can do. And that's what competition is. Hmm. So even though the person standing there with a white belt in front of you and is extremely competent, maybe they didn't prove it. They haven't proved it. So if you don't have some kind of standing, and that is one of the things we see in law enforcement now, that it it becomes a participation ribbon. People aren't re- right. you know, aren't regarded for their skills. You know, it's just like if somebody doesn't, you know, you can't actually say, well, he's a ninety percent shooter or a a hundred percent shooter. Got a hundred percent on the course, but nobody wants to bring that up anymore, which is weird. Mm. You know, well, what about you, Nick? Any uh, interesting moments over the years on the range? That uh... well, a, a couple of things are occurring to me. But I mean, the first thing is Paul talking about this um, competing and stress. Ayub, one of the finest instructors in the states, totally calls it stress inoculation. He says right. anybody who carries a gun seriously should compete because the stress of competing helps when you get into the stress of the real thing. 
plus the confidence you're given means you're less likely to shoot in a panic because mm. you know you have the situation under control. <laughs> or you don't, and then you shoot quickly. Um, <laughs> but to get back to what you originally asked was the most satisfying thing in instructing is when you've got a guy whose target looks like a paper doily and you work with him and suddenly they get it. Mm -hmm. And suddenly the groups start to shrink, the speed increases and they look competent. That is a tremendously satisfying oh. experience. Now, from interesting things, I remember working a line and I was walking the line and checking everybody's okay, going good, you know what you're doing, yeah. And I come up to this guy and I said, everything going well? He said, yes, it is. I turned around, walked three steps, and his gun exploded. And a big <laughs> hunk of gun suddenly shot past my ear. Yeah. So I thought, hello? <laughs> Maybe not as well as he thought. What happened there? Yeah, we stopped the line. Did we find out why it exploded? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I just did a demonstration of what I think went wrong, which is he couldn't reload for toffee. Right, loading yeah. his own ammo. Yeah. Whoops. Mm. Yeah, probably a double or a triple charge or right. something. Uh, when you're talking about different perceptions, I was teaching in Eastern Europe, and we were doing a, um, a dynamic type of teaching to people who had progressed. And we had these guys in who were in the, the local law enforcement unit. And what they were supposed to do was move into a crime scene, investigate, at which point they would find a reason to arrest the guy. The guy they arrested would then, depending on their actions, do something like pull a gun mm. to see what they would do. So, fine. They arrest the guy. Now, this guy that um, was acting as the, uh, the criminal was a very highly trained um, guy from Portugal in their special units. And he does this thing where he, the gun gets drawn as he's running forward and he goes into a forward roll and comes up, as it were, shooting. <laughs> and these guys from the local police department were just kind of standing there watching him. As we used to say in the army, thumb up the bum, mind in neutral. Yeah. So, so he says, guys, guys. What's going on here? You're supposed to be taking action. And he looks at me and he says, we told him not to move. When we tell people not to move, they don't move. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm looking at the time here. I know there's a lot more that I want to talk about, but maybe it'll make for another podcast. Uh, we'll see what the, uh, the audience comes back with and if there's any questions that they might have that uh, they'd want to pose to uh, any one of us here. We've talked a fair bit about firearms instructing, predominantly in Canada. I'll end it with pistol, rifle, shotgun. What's your favorite platform to train somebody on? Paul? Oh, I mean, pistol for sure. Uh, and of course, revolver. Let's not just leave it at uh, slide guns here. Both Nick and I are, are lovers of the wheel gun, mm -hmm. like true lovers of the wheel gun and, and find that continual fascination. But yeah, uh, I got to be honest. If you were asking to learn how to shoot trap or skeet, I'm not your man. Mm -hmm. I can do it. Sure but I'm certainly not, uh, that's not my field of expertise. Yeah, you held your own at the, at the last event <laughs> well, we did there. But let's go back to when you say all three. I don't want to be horning in on Nick here, but work at one, you'll get better at the other mm -hmm. almost naturally. There's there's some carryover between them all, but I think pistol is my favorite to teach. I can't disagree with you. Handgun is by far my preference both for using as well as for teaching mm -hmm. um i do get a certain amount of enjoyment and satisfaction out of teaching with the social shotgun social right shotgun. yes i mean i combat shotgun i've got no problems you know i i feel totally competent with that um well that's your background that's your yep. experience that's what and for my own personal just satisfaction when i sit at my loading press and I put together my own formulation of ammunition for my rifle and I go out and I put three holes touching mm. and then everything works. That is just, you know, the precision instrument of rifles for just pure oh, joy, pure joy of shooting. I, I like that. But for teaching, yeah, guns. Yeah, sure. definitely. 
Okay, well, we'll wrap it up here. Thank you very much for making the track out, being guests on this podcast here. I uh, definitely hope we'll have a, a number more of these in the, from in the, the hills. In the not too <laughs> two hillbillies from Chilliwack. No. <laughs> <laughs> Way out. Uh, okay, well, thank you very much. We'll wrap it up. You know, it just struck me. I got no idea how to wrap up a podcast. So I think maybe uh, we'll just stop it right here.